Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give him great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt him from taxes in, in Israel. David asked the man standing over him, what will be done for the, the man who kills the Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him. This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Enlab, El David's eldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked, why do you come down here? And with whom do you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a, a young man, and he has been a warrior for, since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it and re rescued it from the sheep's mouth, from the, its mouth. Then it turned on me. I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has been has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has, he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David from his own tunic. In his own tunic, he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened the sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag and with this thing in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him was coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. He despised him. He said to David, am I a dog? that you would come with me at sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come again you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head this very day. I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's I'll give you all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer and to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to, give, to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone, the, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down onto the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. 
Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from the sheath after he killed him and cut off his head with the sword. So, uh, there is uh, a valley. And on one side, we have the Israelites uh, lining up and getting ready. You can see this in verses 1 and 2. And uh, on the other side of the valley, the Philistines are lining up and getting uh, ready for a battle. So, so strangely, uh, uh, Goliath kind of steps forward, c- comes down like that into a valley. But even though he goes down and the Israelites are looking down at him, they can still see how huge he is. Okay, you can clearly tell. And I think you would be able to tell Um, We're told a champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That may well be nine foot nine in our language. Okay? That's huge, isn't it? Now, Trish was telling me that she's got a cousin who is seven foot two. Is that right? Okay. That's pretty big. The NBA, any basketball fans here? Okay, no, fine. The NBA uh, has a number of people in the mid seven foot range. So there's been a couple of people seven foot seven, a few at seven foot six, a few at seven foot five. Okay. These are giants really, but nine foot is huge. Even looking down on someone who's nine foot, you would be intimidated by their size. I was in B&M Bargains the other day, and I'm not a tall man. A tall man walked past me. He was one of the gym types. He was in his short and his vest, with muscles coming out of his muscles. Uh, One of the young teenage girls who was standing in the aisle swooned ever so slightly (laughs) as he walked past. And I felt intimidated. I did. And I just had to, Andy, stop it. I had to say to myself, just go and find the mop you've come in here for. (laughs) So I did. I went and bought the the mop. And I didn't think much more about it until I was preparing this service. Because there was a moment where I did feel slightly intimidated by this man who was much bigger than me. That guy who was slightly intimidated me, he was not nine foot nine, okay? Imagine someone nine foot who's also trained in battle, who's been a warrior since their youth, who is not just tall but is also strong, probably wide, probably muscular, okay? And then uh, verse uh, five uh, details some of the armor he was wearing, which would have been incredibly heavy, For anybody else, maybe not so much for him because he's so huge. But detailing the armor, it makes him even more intimidating. Okay. I think you might feel a sense of intimidation if you saw somebody uh, this big. In fact, I know I would because in verse 11, we're told on hearing the Philistines' words... And those words were from uh, Goliath. He said, this day I defy the armies, armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Okay. Um, we, we're told in verse 11, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Dismayed and terrified. Okay. Have you ever felt dismayed? And terrified? Probably. The, we're all emotional people. These are emotions that we, we do feel. But the, the story is clear how the Israelites felt. Now, there is a familiar refrain in the Bible. It's a command, I believe. Um, it says, do not be afraid. 
Does anybody know how many times that appears in the Bible? 365. There you go. One for every day of the year. 365 times we are told, do not be afraid. Okay? Isn't that wonderful? If anybody ever asks you what the Bible says, you can tell them. Actually, 365 times God tells his people not to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid because God is with us. Okay? But because we're emotional, we sometimes will feel that. But, but take notes. That was the reaction. Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed um, and terrified. And then whew, the scene completely changes. Uh, in this story, like a TV program where you're looking at one scene with one group of people and then we just go to a completely different house with a completely different group of people having a completely different conversation. There's a total scene change and here we come to Jesse, David's dad, and it tells us a bit about uh, Jesse's family. He has three sons, Eliab, Abinadab and Shammah, who have gone to be with Saul. They've gone to the front line. They've gone to fight. David, we're told, is going back and forth. That's interesting. That suggests to me he wants to go and fight, but he's been told he has to look after the sheep. Okay? So he's going back and forth. Sometimes he's with the people, with Saul, but then he has to come back and do his duties um, as a shepherd. And verse 17, uh, we're told... Stories like this remind me that, you know, I love the Old Testament, really. Um, the earthliness of it sometimes. Jesse was uh, a supporter of Saul and the people. He was also a caring dad who wanted to know how his sons were getting on. And so he sends David. He says, take these things with you, okay? Take along these ten cheeses and give them to the commander, all right, take these loaves of bread and this ephah of roasted grain. Take this to your brothers. Ask them how they're doing and come back and tell me. Okay, so that's the scene. He wants to know how it's going. So early the next morning, David does as he's told. He goes off uh, to find out, you know, what's going on. How are things progressing? How are his brothers doing? Uh, so off he goes. Um, and when he gets there, he says... What's going on? He first asks if his brothers are okay, and they say yes, and then you can see, obviously, the, the, the men are all in a bit of a mood. They're dismayed, they're terrified. David says, what's going on? And he's told, there are riches and the king's daughter for the man who is willing to go forward and fight the champion. Who's the champion? Just look over there, okay? And then they see Goliath. Actually, David is feisty. He says, who is this man who, can, who, can make, who thinks he can make us uh, feel this way? Uh, and he, he asks some, uh, some other people, what's going on? And they tell him the same thing. There's riches and the king's daughter for the person who fights there. Now, Eliab, the oldest brother, says, what are you doing here? Hmm? What are you doing here, David? The sheep? Who's looking after the sheep? Can you go away, please? You're here to cause mischief. You're conceited. You just want to watch a war. When you've got a job to do, you should be doing that. I'm going to tell Dad, okay? I'm going to tell Dad if you don't go home. We're going to have to have words about this, David. You shouldn't be here, okay? So that's the older brother's line. You can always trust your brother to make you feel good about yourself. Okay, so that's Eliab's line. Meanwhile, somebody else, I think, has seen an opportunity here. Maybe someone who doesn't want to go and fight Goliath. Because Saul sends for David. And that can only be the case if somebody has gone to Saul and said, I think you need to speak to that man over there. I might have found you a volunteer. Okay. <laughs> I've been in committees at times, maybe you have too, where there's a job to be done that nobody really wants to do. And you can see suddenly, almost telepathically, the committee will pick somebody out 
and say, we think, we think you would be a good person to do this job. Uh, maybe a bit of that's been going on. But whatever happened, the king sends for David. Uh, and David said, do not lose heart about that soldier there. I'll take him on. What was Saul's response? David uh, is not on. I'm sorry, but you can't. You're not even here all the time. You should be looking after some sheep somewhere. It's not really your job. You're not really trained to do this. You're not really old enough. You're not really big enough. You don't really have the right armor. You don't carry the right kind of authority. I'm sorry, you're just not really made of the right stuff to take this job on. Okay? This is basically what, what he's being told. And uh, like a, a, a slightly underqualified man at a job interview, David says, but I have done this. And he talks about how he's bravely fought uh, large, uh, dangerous animals in order to protect the sheep in the flock, uh, and how he's been victorious in doing so. And Saul, who frankly doesn't have many other options because the rest of his men are terrified and dismayed, he says, okay, go. So, verse... Um, uh, in the verses that follow, we see a couple of things which are perhaps worth us taking note of. Verse 38, we're told, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around. Now, if I was David, I would have tried walking around just in front of Eliab, okay? Hi, Eliab. Just wearing the king's tunic, carrying the king's sword, wearing the king's helmet. I don't know if it was the king's sword or not, but it was certainly the king's tunic, okay? You all right, Eliab? What do you think of this, okay? He might well have been tempted to do that, and he might also have been tempted to think, thank goodness he's given me some armor. That'll help me in the battle. Okay? He might also have been thinking, well, the king's put me in this. I can't say no. I can't very well say no. This is the king's armor. What an honor. I can't say no to this. But David doesn't actually do any of these things. He uh, says, actually... I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. They don't really fit me. Okay? Now, I think there's a, a small lesson for us here. You know, Jesus, when he was talking to uh, the disciples, he said, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Okay? Not who have you been told I am. Who do you say I am? You know, Jesus calls us Jesus calls you, not the person sitting next to you. Jesus calls you, and he knows you, and he calls you as you are. He's got things for you to do that only you can do. So you don't have to pretend to be somebody else, putting on somebody else's armor, doing this course or that course, taking this person along with you, although actually it's good to take somebody along with you. Um, but actually, Jesus calls you as you are. He knows you've got a role to play in his kingdom. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. Okay. So that's the one thing we notice. And we have, can have confidence that as we who God has called go as we are, knowing that he knows us and he knows all our faults and failings, but he calls us anyway because he's got work for us to do, we can have confidence that he is with us. And that's David's confidence. It's not the armor he needs, it's God he needs with it. That's the first thing we see. And the second thing we see, I've just kind of given it away, confidence that God is with him. David has confidence that God 
is with him. You know, this is another thing that is said quite frequently in both the Old and New Testament. The Lord tells us he's with us. Okay, He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He's with us to the very end of the age. Be bold and be strong, we sang, for the Lord your God is with you. Now, those are words from Joshua. So contrast the attitude of the army with the attitude of David. The army are looking at the size of the challenge. David is looking at the size of God. The army are looking uh, at the size of the obstacle in front of them. David knows that no obstacle is too big for God. The army are feeling outgunned, outclassed, overcome. David knows that God can overcome, and God is above everything. Okay? Where are your eyes at the moment? Are you looking at the obstacle, or are you looking at God who overcomes? Okay? Are you terrified by the challenge? And if you are, I'm not judging you, because you may have a terrifying challenge in front of you. But are you remembering that God is with you in your challenges? David gets this. He gets this. Um, there was a song that I nearly thought we could sing today, but uh, we didn't go with it. Um, but it's, um, it's a song called Surrounded. It's by Michael W. Smith. And wouldn't you know it, I've just forgotten the words, but they'll, they'll come back to you in a minute. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Okay? That's, that's what we're saying to God. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Okay? As another preacher said it, if it's just you and God, you're in the majority. If it's just you and God, you're in the majority. And so David gets this, uh, and he steps forward, uh, and he takes, we know the rest of this story, he takes Goliath on, and he's victorious. The, um, the gruesome ending, which, you know, young kids absolutely love as he goes, and then... Remember, he didn't take a sword into battle, but in the end he goes in and he takes Goliath's sword and cuts his head off with it. You know, Goliath, he's just not looking so tall now. Okay? His head's gone. That's taken a good foot off. All right? He's also, the story tells us, uh, he's actually, he's on the floor. He's, he's dead. He's out. Now, the story tells us David is standing over him, okay? The obstacle has been overcome, and God has been glorified. It's a very gruesome way, this, in which God has been glorified. But the, those Israelites who were cowering because their eyes were looking at the challenge rather than in the strength of God, they're now not worried about the challenge anymore. They're praising their God, and that's why God has been glorified. And it's the Philistines, we were just told at the end there, they're now scared, and they run off. Let me pray for you. Father God, we pray today that you would be glorified. We pray that you would be glorified by the way we live our lives, by the way we worship you in this place by the way we worship you in our homes, by the way we conduct our business in all the various avenues of life that we represent here today, and by the way we humbly walk with you day by day. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified. Lord, give us courage. Increase our courage, we pray. Increase our faith, we pray. For Gifts of faith and courage as they are can be fanned into flame by us but also can be strengthened by our trust in you. 
So, Lord, help us to walk in trust in you, in all that is before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.